Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. My name's Hannah on this channel. I post a lot of anti MLM content. As always, I'll link a playlist right here and in the description box. This is my big anti MLM playlist. I want to see how many we actually have on that playlist now. We hit 100 videos a couple months ago and since then I've just been saying over 100. 121. This will be the 122nd video on that playlist. Super bingeable and if this content is interesting to you, I would love it if you would consider subscribing and liking this video. Those things really help to support my channel and I appreciate you so much for doing that. Today's video, as I'm sure you already know, is another MLM horror stories. These are the personal experiences that people have had with MLM companies that they have sent in to me and given me permission to read for a video. If at any point you have your own story you would like to send, the instructions for how to do that are in the description box. I can never, ever, ever have too many stories. The more stories, the more videos we can make. So please don't hesitate to send yours in if you've been thinking about it. But before we read the stories, I do wanna tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Scentbird. Scentbird is a flexible fragrance subscription service that is reimagining the way we discover, shop for, and experience fragrances. With Scentbird, you get to choose different designer fragrances every month for only $17. You are in control. You get to choose which fragrances you would like to try, so there are no surprises. And there's even a quiz on the Scentbird website to help you get started and narrow down your options based on your personal preferences. Each fragrance comes in a 30-day supply, and the packaging is sleek. It's easy to use. You just twist it like a tube of lipstick to reveal the fragrance. It's perfect for your vanity as well as travel. I've had the pleasure of working with Scentbird for a while now, and at this point, I'm really building up my collection of fragrances. In the past, I've always considered myself to be not a fragrance girl, and that honestly just came down to the price. I am not the type of person to spend upwards of $100 for a bottle of designer fragrance, especially if I don't know if I actually love it first. It can smell one way in the store and then smell completely different once you've been wearing it for a few hours. So therefore, I've never really owned nice fragrances, and I've certainly never had a collection of them to choose from, and this is where Scentbird has been a saving grace. It's only $17 a month to test out new fragrances and build your collection. My favorite one that Scentbird sent me this time is Christian Siriano Midnight Silhouette. Usually I gravitate towards very light, fresh scents, but this one has notes of red salt, pomelo, vetiver, and praline, and it's kind of the perfect evening date night scent that I've been looking for. I'm at the point now where I have a few of my favorite scents out on my bathroom counter, and I've been loving having the choice of like, which kind of luxury do I want to smell like today? It's kind of like a fun little fragrance roulette, if you will. If you would like to start building your own fragrance collection, visit the link in the description box and use the code Alonzo at checkout. This is going to give you 55% off your first month at Scentbird, which means that you're going to get a 30 day supply of a designer fragrance for a little over $7. Thanks again, Scentbird, for your continued support of the channel. And now let's get into these horror stories. This story says, hello, Hannah, my name is blank, but for the video, please refer to me as Louise as I wish to remain anonymous. I am naming my family after the characters in Bob's Burgers simply for convenience and so I can keep their privacy, especially since my mom and sister who are the main characters of this story have also started watching your videos. They are both okay with me submitting this tale. So for the story, your mom's name is going to be Linda, your sister is Tina, and your dad is Bob. I love it. I've been watching your videos for a while now. I stumbled upon the anti-MLM community after watching the Lula Rich documentary on Amazon. I watched your deep dive and then got completely enthralled by your top fails and horror stories. Your friendly and understanding take on MLMs as you explain what problems they cause has me hooked. LuLaRoe was a big part of my family for way longer than I would like to admit, and watching the documentary had brought back all the memories of that truly wild time. I could not go an hour without hearing words like Carly, Amelia, etc. Which by the way, if you're not familiar, those are the names of the different styles in LuLaRoe. So if you're wearing a Carly, that's like a specific type of shirt or dress or whatever. I don't know the types, <laughs> but all the pieces have names. Now, while I was never that interested in the clothing, not my style at all, my mom, Linda, and older sister, Tina, were frankly obsessed, which is strange considering that neither were roped into selling. That's right. This is a story about customers and how the toxic culture of FOMO and love bombing sucked them in. I'm loving it. Let's go. A little bit of backstory. My sister had gone through a rough breakup with her longtime live-in boyfriend and was forced to move back home with our parents. I I too was living at home as I had fallen very sick while living abroad and was going through extensive medical testing. I am fine now. Great. Love to hear that. So my poor parents had gone from having no kids in the house to having two. At first, I didn't really notice much when the clothing started coming in. It wasn't uncommon for my sister to buy herself little feel better gifts. <laughs> and then my mom started getting things little by little. Both my mom and sister are teachers, so they would wear the clothing to work. Again, I didn't notice anything too strange. They were on their phones a lot more, but it wasn't too bad in the beginning. 
keyword being beginning. As time went on, the amount of time Linda and Tina spent on their phones was becoming noticeable. My dad, Bob, would have to remind them constantly about doing other tasks. They would lose track of time watching Facebook Live sales while we were still out at dinner or at doctor's appointments. They were following the same hun that we will call Gretchen. Gretchen seemed nice. She catered to a lot of older and plus sized women. I hear from Tina that she is no longer affiliated with LuLaRoe, so that's good. Now, the live events were unreal to me. I ended up watching a few because that was all my mom and sister seemed to do. They were every day. Gretchen would go to the camera and hold up a god awful piece of clothing and rave about how great it was. Sometimes it would go fast, other times it would not. When it didn't, she would often start talking directly to her clients. Linda, this is so you. I got it with you in mind. I just knew this would be something Tina loved, so I saved it just for you. Remember, there's only one, so hurry. At the time, I thought it was weird that if she allegedly got them for my mom or sister, why was she offering them to the other clients? I thought maybe she just didn't have that many clients. Now that I know that the fashion consultants couldn't even pick their own clothes, I realize I was right to be sus. Yes, I was hoping you would point that out. The way LuLaRoe works is you buy a bunch of inventory that then you are responsible for reselling and shipping. In the early days of LuLaRoe, you would pay like $5,000 for a starter kit and they would send you this many leggings, this many tops, this many dresses, whatever it was in the package that you picked, but they wouldn't tell you what the patterns were. It would just show up at your door. You would have an idea of the number of different types of pieces you were ordering, but you didn't know what they looked like until they were in your hands and until it was your responsibility to start selling them. So this is pretty sneaky that she's like, look at this print, isn't it fabulous? I got it just for you. I ordered it because I knew you would love it. Complete bold face lie. Unless I'm missing something, unless there's something that I don't know about where they did get to pick a print, but I'm pretty sure they didn't. Because that's kind of a selling point for LuLaRoe. It's the whole idea of the unicorns. You would have good prints and bad prints, and then you would have rare unicorn prints that you would always want to get your hands on. It's completely absurd because it's these women that are adding such value to things that have very little value. A pair of leggings with hamburgers all over them? Nobody wants that, okay? But if you tell people this is rare, this is a unicorn, you are therefore adding value to it. And I think that's exactly what Gretchen is doing on these live streams. Hey, Linda, look, I got this special for you. Don't you want it? And it's interesting that she's making those comments only after she's given it a couple minutes and nobody has bit on that piece yet. Super sneaky and it's absolutely an intentional tactic. The worst of it was this month where Gretchen was doing a contest. She was giving away prizes of $50 of Lula cash for first place, $25 for second place, and $10 for third. The contest was to comment, like, and share Gretchen's posts the most for a month. This seems even sillier in retrospect because what would the $50 even get you? Two pairs of leggings, if that? One and a half Disney leggings? Linda and Tina were gone. The whole month they were glued to their phones. My father and I would just sit across from each other making up wilder and wilder stories just seeing if we could get a reaction out of either of them, but no. I gotta give it to Gretchen, that's pretty innovative. To the people out there who share and comment and like my posts the most, they're gonna get a product credit. It. Wow, I've, I don't think I've ever heard of that before actually, but it's kind of smart, especially the sharing part of it. Because if you're having people out there sharing your posts to their own friend groups, to their own followings, that gives you more exposure for free. You are casting a wider and wider net by giving people the opportunity to enter into like a contest or giveaway that you're hosting. That is insane. Now, remember when I mentioned I was sick during this time? My mother became a little less active when she was taking me to medical tests and Gretchen instantly sends a message just like, quote, Hey Linda, it's your consultant Gretchen. I know Louise is sick, but I was just updating you on the standings. Tina is in first, you're in second right now, but Cindy is catching up to you with a winky face. And yes, Gretchen knew about my being sick and why my mother wasn't online. That makes me feel so gross inside that this woman is keeping such heavy tabs on where people are in the rankings of this contest and that she's kind of inserting these little pieces of FOMO, like Cindy's catching up to you, you better get online and start sharing 
sharing my posts more when she knows full well what the circumstances are and why your mom has a very valid reason why she's not online right now. At the end of the month, a few of the other women began complaining and Gretchen threw out the idea of just giving everyone who participated $5 Lula cash instead of having real prizes. That way everyone could be a winner. To say Tina threw a fit was an understatement. Linda was upset too, but she is a lot more quiet than Tina. It ended up that Gretchen did give everyone the $5 prize, but Tina and Linda got to get one pair of free leggings each and a mystery pair. Spoiler alert, they were hideous. That's probably because Gretchen had a couple pairs on hand that she was struggling to sell, so she pawned them off as a makeshift prize. Would we expect anything less? Eventually, the talk of LuLaRoe subsided and it stopped altogether. After it was over, I told Bob and Linda about the docuseries and they were both interested. We watched it together and I learned more about what went down with my family during that time. Linda described the feeling of being in a cult. She was constantly told this was just for her. She would look so good. She needed this and it would be gone soon. She was even told that non LuLaRoe clothing didn't look as flattering on her. Linda has her own body issues that she struggles with despite being very healthy. Apparently she had fallen so deep into the online parties that Bob had to sit her down and gently go over how much she was spending. She described it as snapping out of a fog. I learned both Linda and Tina were approached about becoming Gretchen's downline. However, Linda has anxiety and knew she would be unable to make sales and Tina was unable to afford the startup fees. Bob refused to lend her the money as he was floored by the high cost at the time and saw no way to get it back and they were already helping with my medical expenses. So they remained customers, but they had real rapport with Gretchen. Tina even talked about inviting her to her wedding once she and her ex had gotten back together. However, once they stopped buying as much, Gretchen faded out of their lives completely. Funny how that works when there's no money to be made, right? What bothered me the most about this entire ordeal is that it felt like LuLaRoe was preying on Tina and Linda. They were constantly told, you look so good, you're beautiful, you rock these styles, etc. I now realize this is probably love bombing, but for two women who were going through a lot and already had pre-existing body issues, it just felt skeevy. Nothing in the exchanges felt genuine when I watched. It bothered me because I felt like my family was being taken advantage of. Fortunately, both Linda and Tina are doing well now and are no longer LuLaRoe diehards. Linda is happily retired and Tina is married with her first baby. A little bonus story, I do have a family friend whose daughter-in-law is a nurse slash young living hun. I didn't really know anything about young living until watching your videos, but this hun was constantly pressuring me to use her oils and supplements because it was going to fix my dietary issues. Fun fact, I did not have dietary issues at all. I had a weirdly specific food allergy. I tried to explain to her that I have a pretty restrictive diet and needed to know the ingredients. She told me that I did not in fact need to know the ingredients as there was nothing in these supplements that I would be allergic to. <laughs> she sent me a few samples by mail through our family friend. I'm sure you are shocked to find out that when I read the ingredients, I was allergic to them. When they asked how I liked the samples, I was honest and I said I couldn't take them. She seemed shocked, so I explained my unusual food allergy, to which she informed me I probably wouldn't react to it in the supplements because of how it's processed. I was just like, okay, and let the subject drop. It's now sitting on my counter. Anyway, thank you for taking the time out to read this. I really love your videos and I think you do a lot to give a good name to the anti-MLM community. You show us to be calm, reasonable, and empathetic. You are one of the reasons I am proud to call myself anti-MLM. <laughs> and please love on your cats for me. Best wishes for good health. Thank you so much. Wow. I love this story. This is very important to talk about and to highlight that the manipulation tactics and the kind of cult mentality of it and the love bombing and the toxic positivity, all of those things don't just apply to people who are in the business opportunity trying to make the money. They also apply sometimes to the customers of these products. And I think your story is the perfect example of that, of how your mom and sister, they weren't even a LuLaRoe consultant themselves, but look at how much of their time they spent on their phones, watching live streams. Look at how much money they were spending. In some ways, they might as well have been in the company, right? They were kind of still exhibiting a lot of those same behaviors that the consultants themselves exhibit. And that's very fascinating to consider. I would love to know what happened to all this LuLaRoe clothing, because it sounds like they were very avid customers of it. So I can only imagine they have a pretty big collection. I would love to know after watching the Lula Rich documentary, are they kind of like icked out by it and they don't want to wear them anymore? Or do they still have tons of LuLaRoe in their closets? Very interesting story. Thank you for sending this one in. It says a lot about how the customers of these MLM companies are often subject to the same manipulation tactics that the reps themselves are. This one says, hey Hannah, 
Anna, I'm honestly debating sending this email or not. So if you get this, then that means I finally grew the gumption to send it. My MLM experience brings up a lot of really sad memories for me. And this story is unfortunately long and slightly complicated, but I promise to keep it as short and simple as I can. Thanks in advance for fighting this good fight. Some background on my upbringing before we begin. I'm from Ontario, which is relevant later in my story. And I grew up with my mom doing Pampered Chef and loving it. She grew away from it when I got older, high school age, but I remember being very young and helping her stamp orders and playing with all of her awarded Pampered Chef pins and stuff. To this day, her and my dad's basement is filled with Pampered Chef products that admittedly we still use. I actually like most of the stuff, even if it was overpriced. I don't think she ever did it for the money, but rather because she was finding it hard to meet other adult women, particularly working moms, to be in a friend group with. This MLM definitely saw that vulnerability in her and took advantage of that. I was exposed to other MLMs when I was around 16 years old, when my story takes place. I was really good friends with a girl in my grade. Amy and her mother, Mary, happened to be very well off. Mary was married to the CEO of a huge company in Canada, and they had just sold the company for a huge payout around this time, so Mary decided to buy a horse barn since Amy was into riding. Mary made all kinds of generous offers to all of Amy's friends, myself included, to buy us horses and let us keep them at the barn for free since we all grew up in riding lessons with Amy. It sounds like any 16-year-old girl's dream, right? And for a glorious summer, it really was a dream come true. I bought a horse at a discounted rate through Mary, and I kept him at this barn for free and I even got free riding lessons out of this deal too. Yeah, I can imagine that if you're really into horses and riding, this is a 16 year old girl's dream. I don't know much about owning a horse except for that it is pretty pricey. And so if you're having this mother figure in your life, your friend's mom offering to give you these things for a discount or for free sometimes, it doesn't get much better than that as a teenager, right? At the barn, several of the other girls' moms were in various MLMs, namely Arbon and Stella and Dot. I remember seeing the catalog scattered all over random surfaces at the barn and asking my mom about these companies. She had quit Pampered Chef by this point and she kind of brushed it off saying, you don't want that overpriced tacky junk anyways. So I never gave in when any of the barn moms asked if I wanted to come to their cultish parties. <laughs> to clarify, I was still naive to the actual dishonesty hidden behind the curtain through MLMs. I just knew that this stuff seemed overpriced and not worth the money. At this time, I was looking for a job so I could save up to go to university in a few years. Legal working age in Ontario Ontario is 14, but it's almost unheard of for children that young to get jobs, unless some type of nepotism is involved. So I was jobless for quite a while and slowly became discouraged. A company saw my resume posted on indeed.ca, a job listing site in Canada, and they reached out to me to schedule an interview. I was beyond excited at the prospect of working in sales for something called vector marketing, which I had never heard of, AKA Cutco. But vector marketing sounds better. That's why they call themselves that. I even bought a brand new outfit to wear to my interview and everything. The company had its own storefront, so I had no reason to believe it wasn't legit. Spoiler alert, it was not legit. It was Cutco Knives and they interviewed a bunch of us teens and that day hired every single one of us. I honestly was just so excited to have a job that I didn't pay much attention to the details of what it was that the job entailed. I remember my mom and dad trying to gently warn me that this type of work might not be for me. I have terrible social anxiety, but I didn't listen. I remember being told told that I'd be paid to just perform my presentation to people and I didn't even have to sell anything, so I was hooked. I figured at the very least I could just do a bunch of these presentations, get paid, and never have to sell a thing or go beyond people I didn't know. Side note, the man who interviewed me, Brian, brushed off all the concerns I had about being a literal child and going into strangers' homes. I asked if I could bring one of my parents with me if I ever felt uncomfortable and he told me not to since it might, quote, discourage customers. Yeah, right. I'm gonna have to put a pause on that right there. <laughs> Let's talk about the legal working age being 14 and the fact that Vector Marketing and Cutco is clearly preying on that. It's never actually occurred to me that maybe in different countries, Cutco is operating at different age limits. Cause I know in the United States, you have to be 18, which is why they often go to high schools and they pitch to high school seniors or they'll go to college campuses. They're trying to get young people, but still legally young people for them. But it sounds like here, maybe the case is different 
different in Canada. I think you said you were 16 at the time. Quite literally a child selling knives door to door to people that you don't know that has the potential to put you in some incredibly dangerous situations. And I really don't love that you brought up those concerns and advocated for yourself in that moment. And the person interviewing you and hiring you completely brushed it off like it wasn't even a valid concern because it absolutely is a concern. We should be thinking about these things. But remember at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's not about your safety. It's about getting you signed up for this MLM company so that you can be profited on. Anyway, I drank the Kool-Aid and started pitching to friends and family. My friends were easy. I stressed to them that they didn't even have to listen to the presentation, just pretend they did so that I could be paid. My parents even bought a few things that they still have in the house, those stupid penny cutting scissors being one of them. Then I pitched to a few of the barn moms, the idea being you listen to my pitch and I'll listen to yours. And they all tried to get me to quit my job and work as their downline, which I ignored. Mary, a frequent attendee of these MLM parties, invited me to pitch to her as an offer to help support me in my new job. She had been like a second mother to me for most of my life, so I was naturally very grateful for the invite. She was incredibly generous and kept gushing about how proud she was of me for my first real job. She ended up buying something like $3,000 in product after my presentation. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I ended up with a huge commission check just based on this one sale. Well, huge for a teenager anyway. That is actually shocking to me. That is a turn in the story I did not expect to take. Dropping $3,000 on an MLM pitch is completely baffling in my eyes. Around this time, I got sick with swine flu. Remember the good old days when that was the worst flu you could get? I had some long lasting effects, so I stopped pitching for a while. That's when my best friend texted me something along the lines of, um, dude, I think you're in a pyramid scheme. I just Googled Cutco knives and the results are not great. I jumped onto Google and sure enough, typing in Cutco led me to top results like quote, Cutco scam, Cutco fraud, and Cutco ruined my life. <laughs> yeah, I was done at that point. I did some more research and I'd had enough. I ghosted Brian, cashed my checks and got the hell out. For a month long gig, I made about $400. Word spread at the barn that I had quit Cutco and Mary was furious when she found out. This grown adult woman who I had always considered a parental figure and mentor got mad at me for quote scamming her. She accused me of using her to get a big check and then skipping out on the company. She told everyone who would listen that I pushed poor products on her and that she was the only person I even pitched to. She hadn't even gotten her knives delivered yet so how did she know they were poor quality? She also knew I had actually pitched to almost everyone else at the barn before her because they were all in MLMs and she was not. So I found it easier to pitch to people I had more in common with. She said and did all of this behind my back until I was ostracized at the barn with no idea why. Amy stopped talking to me and my only friend was the same girl from earlier who let me know that Cutco was a scam. I remember I texted Mary one day in tears offering to buy back all of the products she had bought, which was worth more than what I had in my uni savings account and give her the money I had made in commissions off of her sale, but she refused. Granted, Mary has always had some serious mental health problems and I had witnessed her temper directed at others in the past, but I was not prepared for it to be directed at me in full force. A few weeks after this, Mary informed me that my writing lessons would no longer be free since I could quote, clearly pay for them with all the money I earned off of her. I was shocked and heartbroken. Writing lessons at my barn were $50 an hour back then, so I had to cut back my lessons to once a month instead of three times a week. Every time I tried to talk to Mary, she made some excuse to get as far away from me as possible, but I did make it a point to be apologetic every single time I spoke to her. I even volunteered for weeks working at the barn for free to try and make amends with our relationship, but she never budged. This is really heartbreaking on just like a human to human level because the way it kind of appears is that you realized you were in a scam and as soon as you realized you quit and then you tried to explain the situation to her and she's not having any of it. There's like no empathy or compassion coming from her at all. And I'm sort of dumbfounded at the fact that you're offering to buy back the inventory. You're offering to give her your commission check. You're offering to volunteer your time at the barn. You're apologizing every chance you get and she's a complete ice queen to you. 
That's not okay, in my opinion. That doesn't feel right, especially when you're considering a grown woman and a child, and the child made a mistake, as children do. And in my opinion, you're doing everything right. You're taking all of the necessary steps to apologize, to make amends, to make it right in her eyes. And what kind of person do you have to be to not accept the apologies of a child who made a simple mistake? Like, I know that doesn't relate to anything having to do with the MLM itself, but I'm finding myself getting a little bit irritated and upset with this woman for treating you like that. That's not okay. Then she told me she was going to start charging me the $650 per month fee for boarding my horse at her property. I cried for days. I could no longer afford to keep my horse, my dream, my baby. I loved him so much and because I had chosen to pitch some stupid knives to Mary, I had lost him. I had to say goodbye to my companion and best pal knowing he had an old injury, knowing he would be hard to sell, and knowing that the horse meat market is incredibly prominent in my area. I feel sick every time I think about it, even to this day over 10 years later. Oh, I feel sick about that too. I often wonder if there could have been any way I could have reconciled with Mary, but like I mentioned, she did struggle with a lot of mental health problems, and I think she was just looking for a target to blame for her unhappiness, and I just happened to be it. That could be, and that's really unfortunate and devastating. And I just keep going back to the fact that you didn't know at the time, you didn't know that it was a scam. You had absolutely no way to predict that that decision, that seemingly harmless decision to pitch this one particular person would cause this devastating ripple effect for you and things that are completely unrelated to the MLM or to Cutco at all. That's just, it's sick in my mind. I'm really, really upset that this happened. Mary still has and you uses her knives to this day, by the way. My friend, the one who first initially told me about Cutco being shady, keeps in touch with Mary because her dad is best friends with Mary's husband, and she told me she always sees Mary using them. This story does have a happy ending. Last year, I found my old horse again on a Facebook page for rehoming horses in Southern Ontario. I reached out to multiple shelters and found a place in Quebec that would take him if I paid the $800 transport fee to get him out there. I started a fundraiser not expecting anything from it and ended up raising $750 of the funds. I have met up with him at his new home a few times now and he is happy and healthy as a, well, you know. <laughs> I cry every time I think of this story and my time with Cutco because it could have had such a different ending. Imagine if my horse had gone to the meat market after Mary cut me off. I hate thinking about this. I know that ultimately I was a vulnerable young girl who was taken advantage of. I just wish Mary didn't hold so much resistance resentment over me. I honestly didn't know better, and now, looking back as an adult, she should have realized that. Yes, absolutely. It was never about the money for her. She easily could have afforded a $3,000 loss. It was the fact that she felt used, which I understand is very valid, but like I said, I offered to repay her back and compensated her in every way I knew how. My relationship with her was worth so much more to me than a few knife sets, and I'm sorry she never saw that. Writing all of this out has been a long but cathartic process. Feel free to share if I do get around to sending it. Thanks for all that you do. I'm attaching an old picture of my horse for some happy vibes, but please change my name if you use this story. Anyone out there with a fur baby, please hug them extra tight from me. And you did attach a picture of your horse. I'll put it on the screen right here. I feel this immense sense of relief, as I'm sure we all do watching this video, that it did have this kind of ending to it because like you said, it could have gone so much differently. What are the odds that even even after all this chaos, you were still able to get your horse back later on. I'm so unbelievably happy to hear that and relieved. Whew, I feel like I can sleep easy tonight knowing that. And your story is very unique in the sense of the severity of how being in an MLM has sacrificed relationships. That's something that comes up a lot in these videos and in these stories and the clips that I share on my channel and things, that once you join an MLM, you are in a way sacrificing other pieces of yourself and other relationships that you might have. It's extremely common for that company and for someone's decision to be a part of it to get in the way of long lasting relationships that they've had for one reason or another. But the different details of your story are so severe in a way that I can't really wrap my head around, I feel like. As you said, the fact that you were a child, she was a grown adult, she should have had more compassion and understanding for you in all the different ways that she essentially punished you for being a part of an MLM for a short period of time. Typically the stories I get are like, I joined an MLM, and I kept pitching my friend and my friend got annoyed and she cut me off. 
But in those types of stories that we often hear, there is a sense of responsibility placed on that person. Yes, I made the decision to join. Yes, the MLM made me do these things that I wouldn't otherwise do. Yes, here were the consequences that I am responsible for. But that doesn't feel like the case here. I don't truly feel like the full blame can be placed on a young girl looking for a job so that she can pay for university, you know? Especially knowing that you made so many morally correct decisions after the point that you found out it was a scam. I just feel heartbroken for you that this is how it played out. And I want you to know that this is not acceptable. This is not the way it should have gone and you did not deserve that. However, I am so relieved to hear that you have your horse back. What a great way to kind of wrap up that story. And thank you so much for kind of getting up the courage to hit send on this email. I'm sure that everyone listening is super appreciative for that. This next story does contain some trigger warnings. It says, hi, Hannah, contains cancer, young people, dying and Huns being absolute bet. <laughs> I finally worked up the courage to send this. It's absolutely heartbreaking and infuriating to remember, but if it can help someone learn, then it will have been worth it. Please keep me anonymous and the names have been changed. So my brother had a very close group of friends in high school. There were about seven of them and my whole family knew their names. I was a few years younger and a girl, so I was incredibly uncool to hang out with. One of my brother's friends was Josh. Josh was always incredibly friendly, even when my brother and his mates were going through the weird, smelly, insulty, hate women phase. <laughs> Josh had also suffered suffered from cancer for pretty much his whole life. He was going through chemo and operations and had to have his leg amputated twice, one at the knee and the other at the hip. He was the absolute best of us, hardworking, hilarious, and one of the best guys you'll ever meet. Unfortunately, after a few years in remission, tumors were found in his lungs and the rest of his body. He was 21. He still showed up to weekly game nights with my brother and a few of their acquaintances and me. He was always there, full of energy, joking around, and he was more than happy to drive people home at the end of the night, even if they were my friends and they'd only met two hours ago. Then he passed away less than a year later. I'm so sorry for your loss. It wasn't unexpected. He'd been in palliative care for a month. He died late one night surrounded by his family and instantly his friends rallied around his family. Every one of my brother's close friends immediately made their way to either his parents' side or his girlfriend's. As a tag along to my brother, I ended up hanging at his parents' house with Josh's girlfriend and a few others of the side group, which is me, people people's girlfriends, one of their old friend's exes, which is a long story. We were asked to open up Josh's and his mother's Facebooks to help respond to people, saving his mother from having to send 50 plus messages telling them her son's funeral arrangements. The more polite versions of these, quote, Josh has unfortunately passed, his funeral is at so-and-so. Please don't send flowers, I know you mean well, but there are so many flowers, please don't. And to one friend, quote, we would say he's kicked the bucket, but he only has one leg and can't kick. <laughs> that got an honorable mention at his memorial. We were also posting in Facebook groups she was a part of to let them know and putting up posts to ask for photos and memories. Both of these Facebook pages were filled to the brim with soppy captions, photos, well wishes, the whole shebang that happens when someone as rad as Josh dies. For about four days, we kept this up on his mom's behalf. I don't know what happened, but we unwittingly tamed the beast that is Facebook's algorithm and the Huns attacked. The first message we got was from a friend of a friend who had cold messaged her the boss babe spiel about six months earlier. She sent her condolences and asked for the details of any fundraisers that we were having. We sent her the info and about an hour later, we were tagged in a post. It was a long emoji filled piece about how being a part of Rodan and Fields means that she had the money to donate to good causes and that she was so blessed to be able to give so much. She sent a $20 donation that only we could see. The idea of this makes me sick. Just in general, when I see people going on their social media profiles and making some kind of post or some kind of deal to otherwise boast about how charitable they are and all the good deeds they've done, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. There's no need for that. Why can't you just be a good person to be a good person? Why do you have to post about it to get recognition and clout for that? It's really icky. I hate seeing when people do that, period. But now you're roping in the whole MLM aspect of it where she's saying, because of my business, because of my MLM, look at how charitable I can be. So she's basically taking this loss of a 
young person to cancer, which is tragic in itself. And she's flipping it around to make it about her, to gain some recognition for how good of a person she is and to also make a point about how her MLM business is the thing that's allowing her to do that. That's disgusting and I hate it. Then around five days later, we got another message. This was from an oily hun. The message read, quote, so sorry to hear about your loss. I know some great essential oils that can help with grieving. Just let me know, love to help. Do you, do you love to help or do you like making a quick buck off of people who are suffering? Cause I think we all know what's going on here. Stop trying to hide your selfish act of trying to make money off of the misfortune of others under the guise of wanting to help people. Get out of here with that. I hate that. I can't stand when people do that. There were about five more sent over the span of two months, all of them to the account of a woman who was obviously grieving her son. One of them was slightly longer and included the claim that the products quote, were totally organic and wouldn't cause respiratory issues, irritation, chemical burns, or cancer. Luckily, his mother thought this was one of those Nigerian prince scams and brushed it off. Thanks, Hannah, if you finished reading this. It's long, but I just needed to share it. Thank you for sharing it, absolutely. I would love to know what company this was where the woman was saying that their products were totally organic and wouldn't cause cancer. So predatory, so inappropriate. And doesn't that kind of say a lot that the mother was like, oh, this must be a Nigerian prince scam. Brush it off, don't worry about it, move on. It very well could have been an MLM company. And the fact that someone just brushed it off as a scam, period, maybe not even knowing that it was an MLM, that speaks volumes in my opinion. These things feel icky and the things they make people do are icky as well. If you truly wanted to help a grieving mother who just lost a son to cancer, people not in an MLM would probably consider sending a card, sending flowers, dropping off a meal, organizing a meal train, coming over to help do chores, to tidy up, send them a text and check in on how they're doing, give them complete space if that's what they need instead. But that's not the way that people in MLM's brains work. They are conditioned and trained to look at every opportunity as a sales pitch, as a way to make money. So rather than doing things that are actually helpful to a grieving family, they say, hey, I noticed this vulnerability in this really tough time you're going through. I'm gonna pray on that real quick. I'm gonna shoot you a message. I'm gonna pitch you my product. Let me know if you wanna place an order, okay? It's nasty, don't do that. It's crossing a boundary that probably wouldn't otherwise be crossed if that person wasn't in an MLM and they didn't have something to sell you. Again, I'm so sorry for your loss. This is a really tough thing to go through when any young person dies, especially to something as sinister as cancer. It's heartbreaking. It sends ripple effects throughout the entire community of people that love that person. And I will also apologize on the behalf of all these MLM huns that thought that that was a perfect opportunity to try and sell a product. It's so inappropriate. They definitely crossed a boundary there, but I do appreciate you taking the time to write this out and send it so that we can share that on this platform as a way to expose the predatory practices of these companies and of their reps. This story says, hi, Hannah, I love your channel and the work that you're doing. You're so well-spoken and respectful. And from one educator to another, I appreciate that. Please keep me anonymous for this story, of course, and thank you for your kind words. This story isn't typical in that it involves my dad being pitched, not me. To give some important background, both my parents are immigrants from Greece. They live with me and do not speak English. My mom didn't really let the language barrier stop her for long. She's quick to make friends everywhere she goes, no matter the dialect. But my dad was a little more shy and insecure about it. This summer, in an effort to meet more people in my neighborhood and make new friends, my mom and I encouraged my dad to attend gardening classes at a local library, since we both know that's something he's always really enjoyed. Plus, he'd been practicing his English and by this point knew just enough to take away the major points from a short conversation. He was really excited to go and we were both happy for him. However, after a few meetings, he became a little more hesitant to go and seemed to be nervous about something. I asked him what was wrong and he said he was confused and apprehensive about a young woman in the classes who wouldn't leave him alone. He couldn't understand what she wanted from him, but told me it made him very uncomfortable and bothered when she constantly hounded him at the door before classes and on the way out after. He said he didn't even have time to look at the different gardening displays by himself or take the time to actually absorb any information as this woman was always trying to engage with him in conversation. I'm putting together the context clues, okay? I'm assuming this person is in an MLM, but aside from that, that is so frustrating and annoying. If you're just trying to go about your business in any kind of setting and there's someone who will not stop hounding you about whatever it is, that's annoying. People don't like it when you do that to them, especially if they're not engaging back with you. Typically you can pick up on the social cues and if that person is interested in talking to you, they will continue the conversation. But that's not the impression I'm getting here. I'm getting the impression that your dad just wants to go to this gardening class. It's something he enjoys. 
and there's like a little chirpy bird on his shoulder that won't shut up about whatever she's trying to pitch. That would be so annoying. Don't do that to people. But since my dad is insecure in his English and didn't want to be rude, he didn't know what to do or how to handle it. I asked him what she was talking to him about and he said he couldn't catch it all, only something about quote, opening a store. I'm sure you can see where this is going. The following class, I offered to drive him to the library and wait with him for the teacher so the woman wouldn't bother him. I also wanted to get to see who this chick was myself and what on earth she could possibly want with my 76 year old immigrant father. Sure enough, within five minutes, a middle-aged lady got out of a car, parked a few spots down from ours and started waving at my dad. She came up to us and said hi to him and I told her that my dad doesn't know very much English and that I am his daughter. I asked if I could help her with something since she seemed to want to talk to my dad so much and her smile widened. Of course, she gushed. I just loved your dad's go-getter spirit. Um, what? I thought that was a weird thing to say, but try not to judge people too quickly. So I gave her the benefit of the doubt. For about a half a second, that is. <laughs> Quote, that kind of attitude is perfect for success in my new small business. Yep, my dad was being targeted by an Amway, hun. She proceeded to tell me about the fantastic opportunity for me and my parents, the entire spiel, blah, blah, blah. What she said next though was really what struck me and made me angry. Your father is the perfect success story. He would do so great in this business. Foreigners start their own restaurants and dry cleaning shops all the time. I was mortified. The profiling and gross vernacular aside, it absolutely infuriated me that this woman was trying to manipulate someone who clearly could not speak enough English to understand or refute her claims. She had been bothering my father endlessly during these classes and made him feel so pressured all for her to make a sale. I calmly told her that I did not appreciate her categorizing all immigrant people to together like that and that my father was not interested in her business opportunity. The smile faded from her face and she looked annoyed, like I was the one who had said something offensive. Quote, I'm not being racist, I'm just telling the truth, she said snidely. <laughs> I... <laughs> I cannot with that. Also, I hope my kids don't smother me when I'm old and live with them like you do. My jaw was on the floor for a good few seconds, but it didn't really matter because she walked away in a huff and got back in her car. By this point, the classes had already started. I guess she was never serious about gardening, by the way. And my dad was inside avidly listening. I was furious, but also glad that he wasn't there to witness that ugly conversation and that he would no longer be made uncomfortable by the Amway rep. I, however, was left shaken up for a while after that interaction. No kidding. Rightfully so. That's an infuriating conversation to have with somebody. MLMs are no news to me as I've lived in the States for the last 24 years and I've seen my fair share during that time. I've never joined one as they always stuck out strange to me and something always felt off, but I've never considered how they could manipulate and pressure non-English speakers until this experience with my dad. How many other people have been scammed by these companies just because they don't know how to say no, or they don't want to be rude in a country whose customs and language is unfamiliar to them. Them. What would have happened if I hadn't been there to intervene with my father? It makes me angry that she basically ruined his initial experience with these classes by constantly pressuring him and never leaving him alone. My dad was much happier after that day and told us that the lady never spoke to him again and only came to one more class before she stopped going altogether. I highly suspect she only signed up as a way to scout out potential victims. I hope this brings awareness to the practice of MLM scamming immigrants and or non-English speakers. Keep up the good work and give the kitties some pets for me. I don't think that's too far off of an assumption that maybe she was just joining these local community activities and groups as a way to, like you said, scout out potential victims. Amway in particular, we see this trend of people not taking to social media as a way to recruit and sell. It's very interesting. They stay off of social media intentionally. It's a company that's been around for decades. They are very well known. There's been lots of bad publicity and press about them. And in my opinion, I think that's why they try to stay off of the internet because if you were to cold message somebody, hey, I have this great Amway business opportunity for you, there's a very good chance that that person already has a preconceived negative notion about what Amway is and it's a very ineffective way for them to be able to pitch. And that's why I think they focus so much on the in-person interactions, the coming up to you in grocery stores, setting up at craft fairs or conferences or joining these groups to meet people in person and kind of get them on the hook a little bit before they actually pitch 
pitch what the company is. I really appreciate you taking the time to send in this story because this is an issue of immigrant or non-English speaking people being targeted for these companies for all the reasons you already outlined. They may not know what that company is. They might not know the social norms of the interactions within that country and how to politely turn somebody down when they're hounding you and they won't leave you alone. There's absolutely a whole American dream aspect attached to it as well. Come to this country, the land of endless possibilities and start your own business, right? It's this classic trope of the American dream that puts a target on people's back if they have immigrated to the United States. I hate hearing that your dad was the target of this kind of interaction, but at the same time, I'm so appreciative that you have sent in this story because this is absolutely a predatory dynamic that deserves to be talked about more. So thank you so much. This one says, hi, Hannah, my name is blank. I'm a pretty new listener, but was instantly hooked on your channel and content. And I've been binging you for about the last week or so since I discovered you. If you choose to read this one, please don't use my name. Fortunately, I don't have too many experiences with MLMs, but I thought it would be funny to tell you about the time that I was assailed by what seemed to be an attempted essential oil pitch literally in the middle of having a surgery. <laughs> Oh God. I have some problems with my eyes and I get these awful things called chalazians, I think that's how you pronounce it, that require surgery for removal. I was in the middle of a bad flare up in 2019 and I had an appointment at my local hospital where they do small eye procedures. These surgeries are really fast, often only taking 10 to 15 minutes total and are not too painful overall. So they only inject local anesthetic on the affected area, which in this case is the eyelid. Sorry to you and to anyone else who is squeamish. Oh God, it sounds so bad. The thought of a needle going anywhere near my eyeball makes my stomach turn. <laughs> anyway, the ophthalmologist was preparing for the procedure and he had a young assistant with him, helping to set up and perform the day's tasks. As they worked, I was expressing to them about how this flare-up had been particularly hard to manage and how frustrating and emotional I had felt about my eyes lately. As the doctor was offering up suggestions for pain relief, symptom management, and so on, the assistant suddenly piped in about if I had ever tried essential oils to help with my eye issues. Uh, putting essential oils oils anywhere near your eyes doesn't sound like a great idea. <laughs> Immediately, the doctor turned to her and said in an exasperated tone, really, Candace, the oils? And she did not say another word about it. We finished the procedure and went our separate ways. Only in hindsight did I sit on this fact and one, think about how funny it is that the doctor shut her down so quickly and how obvious his disdain was as he admonished her. And two, realized by his wording that I was probably not the first patient she had attempted to pitch to based on his phrasing and how fed up he seemed. This encounter was super fast and I cannot necessarily assume that she would have attempted to sell me anything if the doctor had not clapped back so fast. But even that very minimal interaction displays just how opportunistic that people can be. As she had just been listening to me tell them how fed up and exhausted I was by dealing with the effects of chronic eye problems and was also literally in the middle of having needles and scalpels put into my face. At the end of the day, I can't make assumptions about what her motivations were when asking me that question, but I can reaffirm the notion that you have asserted that we should always be on guard and be aware of the fact that people sometimes choose to capitalize on the vulnerabilities of others. Thank you for everything that you do, and I can't wait to hear more of your content. Short and sweet, love it. And even though he snapped back in such a quick way, I feel like that one little sentence saying, really, Candace, the oils, that can speak volumes about their interactions, their relationship. And based on the tone, I would probably also assume that this wasn't her first time and that he was kind of annoyed by it. I don't think you're too far off base here to assume that she was probably trying to sell you something. And especially knowing what we know about the essential oil MLMs like doTERRA and Young Living and how these people are convinced that there is an oil for everything. It's probably not too far off base to assume that she was in an MLM and she was trying to make a quick buck on you. Just imagine how many people she's pitched to, right? If that's her job and she just has this constant rotating door of new patients coming in with an ailment. That's kind of her perfect setup, right? But clearly the doctor had enough of it. And he's like, we need to cut this out. Stop pitching people oils while they are getting surgery, Candace. And with that, my friends, it's all the stories I have for you for this MLM Horror Stories video. Thank you again to everyone who sent in their stories. And thank you again to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Remember to check out the link in the description box and use the code Alonzo for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. And while you're down there, check out the instructions for how to send me stories if you do have one of your own, I would love to get it. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you and I'll see you in my next one real soon.